All right, guys, BLM here, back with a new video. In this video, just like what I've done for these other seasons of Survivor that I've done 20 year retrospectives of, here we'll be doing a player ranking for the latest of these, and that being Survivor Thailand. So here I'll be ranking every player from Survivor Thailand based on how I feel like they played on this season. Obviously, this season does have a very clear number one, but beyond that, I do think there is a lot of wonkiness throughout this list. But let's start off at the bottom. At number 16, the worst player from Survivor Thailand to me is john raymond and again like i think john raymond is up there for worst players of all time for survivor mainly because he is this person that shouldn't have been the first boot i mean he is this guy that is a very capable physical presence while out there he is someone that seemed socially able i guess but he just ended up rubbing a lot of the people the wrong way i mean he came off as really domineering also like pulling pranks on people that he they didn't appreciate and it's like really he's someone that should not be the first boot i mean even jeff probes himself said at the reunion show that if john raymond were to play again he thinks he would do well because again like on paper he should not be the first boot I mean, he's not the type of person that they should be voting out first especially when they had tanya on their tribe a person who was sick so again to me that's a bigger detriment against john raymond to where he had no reason to be the boot here yet his tribe hated him so much they still boot him here despite him being one of the harder workers around camp and him leading camp life and it also seemed like he had no real allies while out there while helen doesn't vote against him it doesn't seem like that's due to any real relationship john raymond had and really i just feel like john raymond had no real good placement in the game and because of that he is here at number 16 now at number 15 we're jumping over to suk jai for a bit here and we're coming from the first boot from suk jai and that person is jed and jed is a player that i wanted to put higher because i think jed is actually a player that does have a level of potential however i do feel like he does play actively bad i mean he actively isolates himself from the majority group where the majority group on this tribe ends up being the people that worked on the shelter while jed was opposed to working on the shelter and through that isolates himself which again i get that he genuinely didn't think that working on the shelter was the correct move but when the majority of the players are working on the shelter you should work on the shelter as well and again he's another case where there's no reason jed should have been the boot here especially in the position where his own tribe throws the challenge to vote him out i mean jed is probably one of the best physical competitors on this tribe and the fact that they throw the challenge to get rid of him is such a massive indictment against him however i do feel like there are a few pros with him against john i mean obviously he does have stephanie and rob voting with him it did seem like he had a good relationship with rob and also, I feel like he probably does less actively bad work than the next person we'll be talking about. But considering the placements and the fact that, again, there's no reason this guy should have been booted first from his tribe, I do have to land him here at number 15. Now, number 14, again, a person that I think probably played more actively bad, but, but does survive a bit longer, and that person is Stephanie. Now, Stephanie is someone that was greatly affected by the fact that she was sick. Mind you, she was sick due to her own stubbornness in the fact that she decided to sleep out in the cold and rain due to how much she hated the fact that everyone else was working on the shelter but it did feel like the elements really took their toll on stephanie to where again like even in the reunion show they talk about how she was a really fun character in auditions but then that just didn't translate to the island and really she just comes off as grumpy and standoffish while on the island where again like she has the same faults as jed she doesn't want to work on the shelter she isolates herself we do see more of stephanie actually treating the other players poorly to where again like i do feel like stephanie probably does more actively bad work than jed though again does survive around longer also is in a position where like the tribe's literally throwing the challenge to get rid of her so i mean that's also something and again like she's another one that like she was sick and was able to survive beyond jed despite that where again she 100 should have been the boot over jed yet they don't do it so again those are minor pros for me that do leave stephanie above him and number 14 now number 13 who would have guessed it the third in this trio we do have rob with two b's and I actually thought about putting Rob much higher. For me, he was either above or below the next grouping we're going to be talking about. And I did end up landing him below, but I could definitely see the argument for him being above. Now, again, I do think he is also another one that does more actively bad work than the next person we'll be talking about. Where, again, he does get into conflicts with Ken and Sheehan. 
while he does seem to have better relationships with the other side than Jed and Steph, he does also still isolate himself with that grouping. People didn't like his attitude out there. Obviously, he was coming off as very immature. But again, I will say there are some minor pros. Again, one, the fact that obviously he survives both the Steph and Jed boots. Also, the fact that they didn't really want to vote him out. I mean, at the time they voted him out, it wasn't like the Steph and Jed vote-offs where they were very happy to vote them out. The raw vote was something that they clearly felt bad about, and I think that's something to factor in here as well. But I do still feel like at the end of the day, he does get lumped in with the Steph and Jeds of the world, where I just don't think he's that good of a player, as he was really just always on the outside of the Sukjai group. But again, I do feel like there are some minor pros that put him above him, and I could see the debate for him being a bit higher. But for me, he does land here at number 13. Now, number 12, we're going back to Chewy Gone. And this is mostly just a player that I just don't know what to really do with. And that player is Tanya. And Tanya is obviously an interesting case here in the fact that she was voted out because she was sick. However, if she was not sick, I don't know how she would have done. I don't know if she would have done well or poorly. Like, we really don't know. Like, she is someone that is much younger than the rest of her tribe. And through that, you would think that she would be some sort of outcast. However, it did seem like she had good relationships while out there. I mean, even in her eventual boot, Gandia doesn't even want to vote against her. She does have a relationship with Brian Heideck as well. To where he calls himself her big brother. Like, I, I do think Anya could have done well here if she was not sick. However, obviously the fact that she was sick greatly impacts her game. I mean, she's the second voted out here. Kind of in a consensus vote. But, I mean, the fact that she survives the John Raymond vote in a position where they're voting out, like, one of their strongest physical competitors over someone that's sick here, I think is a slight indication of, like, I, I think Tanya could have done well here. But, again, there's so many unknowns. I can't put her too high on the list, but because of the notion of her going home, mainly because she was sick, it does leave her higher in those bottom spots, and she's here at number 12. Now, number 11, we are moving on to the last of the pre fake merge players, and here we do have Gandia. And Gandia has always been an interesting case to me as a player, because like I feel like Gandia is obviously a person that a lot of her run gets overshadowed by grind gate but i think when we look at her as a player I, I do think ganya did have some potential i mean she was a very active player while out there now obviously she was not effective in most of her game talks but she does try to put this like woman group together she tries to get helen and jan to flip against ted and brian and while again like brian is able to pull helen over to his side i do feel like ganya showed some potential there in her actively playing the game. She does survive two vote offs beforehand. Seemed to be pretty well liked before the Ted incident. And really, I do feel like the Ted incident just as a whole really does harm her game. Like, obviously, it's a terrible situation to be put in under any circumstances. But even in the course of the game, it does end up burning her relationships with pretty much all of the men. And also put this, like, massive bullseye on her to where I do feel like if that situation didn't happen... Probably Jan is the easy next boot before Gandia here. So I do think Gandia is a player that I, I think there is some potential there. But again, there are these weird circumstances of Grindgate affecting her game. But also she's tough to place because like technically everything she does is pretty much ineffective. Or she wants to save Tanya. Tanya still goes home. She obviously tries to flip the women against the men and is able to get Jan on her side but isn't able to get Helen Again, like, it's a wonky game, but for me, I end up landing it here at number 11. Now, number 10, we're jumping forward in placement quite a bit. We're going all the way to third place. At number 10, I do have Jan. And this was a weird case here. I mean, usually with every one of these player rankings, I do typically have someone that made it further into the game lower ranked due to a lack of either agency or win equity. And Jan is one of these that, like, I don't think Jan was really playing the game. Like, I, I think the tough thing about Jan is that she's someone that if she gets to the end, she probably wins. I mean, she's someone that didn't really burn anyone while out there and did have, like, some decent relationships. To where I think Jan probably beats both Brian and Clay if she gets to the end. The thing is that, one, she was never going to get there. She was never winning that final immunity. And both Brian and Clay were taking each other. But also, even beyond that, I just feel like she wasn't really playing the game. I mean, really, she was someone that was on the bottom and would have been the next boot had Chewie Gun ever gone to tribal after the Gandia vote. And even in the Gandia vote itself, again, like I think there's a possibility that Jan goes home had the Grindgate situation not happened. But even beyond that, again, she really just stays true to Chewie Gone as the Begonging happens. And then she's given this opportunity when Ted and Helen think about voting out Clay that she just doesn't take advantage of. That she seems to be the reason why it doesn't go through. 
And then once again, when Helen goes home, she could have tried to save Helen, but instead seems content with coming in third place. And really, like, the fact that Brian is, like, openly telling her that you're going to get third and she's just fine with it is so ridiculous to me. And it's like, I don't know how much to really credit Jan's game here. I mean, again, like, at the end of the day, like, I think there is an argument for her being higher solely due to win equity. Like, she is someone that wins if she somehow squeaks her way to the end. The problem is that I have no faith in her actually getting to the end because no one was going to take her to the end. Plus also the fact that she had no real agency in the game. She never actively made any game moves across this season and more so was just following behind what other people were doing that were moves that were not in her best interest. So again, like I, I don't think Jan played a good game at all despite her having some possible win equity and because that she is here number 10. Now number 9 and now we're going to be in for a decent bunch of Sukjai players. And really the next three players that we're going to be talking about are all kind of interchangeable to me. I, I think you can definitely debate on which one should be higher. However, for me at number 9, I did end up going with Aaron. And this was a weird one because I do feel like at the end of the day, Aaron coming into the actual merge situation, had she actually made the merge and the fake merge wasn't a real thing, Aaron is probably one of the safest players on the board. I mean, obviously Penny was a big target that seemed to be the consensus merge boo at that point. She seems like she was perceived as a lesser threat than that of Jake and Ken. And to be honest, probably even of Sheehan. Like, I think Aaron is someone that kind of gets screwed over by the fact that there was the fake merge. And if that didn't happen, then she probably makes it further into game. Though, obviously, I don't think she wins, obviously, as Chugan was always going to stick together. I think her coming in ninth place is something that was definitely affected by the fake merge. However, when looking at the game she played... I do think it's very similar to Penny's. I mean, her and Penny seem to be aligned and we're in that majority alliance on Suk Jai with Xi'an, Ken, and Jake. However, Ken and Jake seem to be aligned and seem to be in lockstep and then Xi'an seemed to be with them. Now, I do think the Xi'an thing is a very questionable as obviously Xi'an messes up for herself and then we see them flip on Xi'an. However, the thing I w don't really know is how loyal were Ken and Jake to Xi'an. Was that actually their three or were they going to turn on Xi'an like they did in real life anyway? But even despite that, Aaron was still the next boot at the next travel they go to anyway, where even Penny flips on Aaron. So again, that's not great. However, I do think some of this ranking is due to a bit of lack of information on exactly how this situation would have played out had Sukhchai gone to the merge with the numbers. But outside of that, like, again, like, it just feels like Aaron was mostly just there. I mean, the fact that she was picked off at that final tribal before the merge makes it seem to me that she was, like, kind of on the bottom of the Sukhchai group. And really, like, we had no explanation on the show of why Aaron is the boot over Penny. That's never truly explained. But either way, like, I, I feel like there are a lot of question marks for me with Aaron. But based on how the game played out, it does make me think of her as probably on the bottom of that majority Suk Jai group. And I don't really feel like she ever really had a path to a win anyway. So for me, she's here at number nine. Now, number eight, we're moving on to, again, like, I don't know where to put this person either. I think there's definitely an argument of her being below Aaron, but I did end up going above, and that person is Xi'an. And again, for me, a major thing I need to know about Xi'an is whether or not Ken and Jake were loyal to her. That is something I don't fully know. However, this placement here is under the assumption that they were, as, again, that's always been my read on it, is I did feel like Xi'an and Ken were definitely close. Jake was probably a bit more up for grabs, but I do feel like Xi'an, had she not flipped at the fake merge, was probably in it for the long haul. I don't know if she wins against either Jake or Ken. So I think that's obviously a massive question mark. But I do think that she could have been part of the core of Suk Jai, but obviously blows it up for herself at the fake merge where she decides to flip instantly to where even if the fake merge had not happened, this is still a really bad move. She is independently flipping to the underside in a position where the old Suk Chais are going to blame her for the flip and through that not want to vote for her, but also putting herself at the bottom of the other side to where she's just going to be picked off along the way. So I think that's all really bad, but I do think the fact that Xi'an even makes it that far to me is somewhat impressive. I mean, the fact that she is obviously at a disadvantage coming into this season with her just having a completely different background than a lot of the other players, and through that not instantly gelling with the Rob, Steph, Jed side of things, also not really even gelling with Aaron and Penny, yet is somehow able to stay within that majority group, mostly due to her relationships with Jake and Ken. 
I think the fact that they're able to keep her around is impressive in its own right, as Shein is someone that probably should have been booted as a consensus boot earlier on. So I do think she does good work in getting herself in the majority, but again, the fact that she blows it up for herself at the merge, I think is a massive indictment on her game, whether or not the fake merge actually ends up occurring. So again, I do feel like Shein was probably more insulated in the game than someone like an Aaron, which is why I have her above. But again, her instantly flipping the Chewy Gone to me is such a bad move. Also, that I can't put her much higher on the list here than number eight. Now, number seven, we're moving on to a player that I really thought was going to be below Shein for a while. But then I feel like there are a couple elements of her endgame that do elevate her a bit, and that person is Penny. Now again, to me, Penny and Aaron are very similar. I think they are on paper back to back. Uh, they played very similar games. They were aligned the entire time. I do think, based on my read, that they were probably on the bottom of that Sukjai majority to where it did seem like Ken in particular was very willing to cut Penny along the way, with Xi'an obviously also having a hostile relationship with Penny and wanting to get rid of her. And it did seem like Penny would have been the merge boot had the fake merge not happened. So I think those are knocks there for me that I think on paper would land her really low. However, I do think she does have little moments of decent gameplay. I mean, I do think the fact that she survives the round where Aaron goes home and doesn't even get a vote against her in that position is pretty good. Like, I, I don't know the full ramifications of why. Now, obviously, we don't see exactly why that happens. I mean, it's never explained on the show why Penny survives that round when Ken seemed to be willing to cut Penny beforehand. But the fact that she does survive that over Aaron, I think, is pretty good work on her end. And I do suspect it has to probably do with her relationship with Jake. But also the fact that she seemed to be willing to cut Jake in her boot round, where she obviously is just part of the pagonging. But the fact that she was willing to separate herself from Jake and eventually vote for Jake herself in self-preservation mode, something that Jake himself wasn't willing to do, I think shows a level of savviness in her. But I do feel like at the end of the day, again, can't really put her too, too high due to the fact that, I mean, to be honest, she wasn't even supposed to get there to begin with. And even then, it was ineffective where she goes home despite turning on Jake. But I do think has these like little moments that do elevate her above both Aaron and Shean for me that do land her at number seven. Now, number six, we're finally moving away from Sukjai. And this is a person that I am mostly conflicted on, where I do think there is an argument for this person being higher. They obviously made it further into the game than the next couple people will be talking about after him but i do feel like the writing was really on the wall and he really should have been able to pull something off along the way but never was and that person is ted and again i think there are good elements of ted's game now early on i mean obviously grindgate happens and like on a modern season like this would ruin his social capital in the game but like it turns out to actually work in his favor where it really solidifies the men of sukjai and he seems to be in a pretty decent spot early on where he does have this final two with Brian that at this point in the game did seem like Brian was actually loyal to or at least was considering being loyal to. He's never really in danger throughout the entire pre-merge section of the game where like despite his conflict with Gandia, Gandia never actually tries to take out Jed. It's always Clay instead. But then once we get to the merge, a couple things happen. I mean, first that we do have Ted seeming to go off on his own a bit to where that causes him to be pointed out as a potential target but then also i mean this is where we do know that brian started to spread rumors and started to slander ted a bit around camp to where that does seem to cause ted to be a target moving forward from the sukjai so where he's obviously voted for at the merge round and is really on the bottom of Chuigan moving forward where even jake is like telling him that you're on the bottom and he doesn't really believe it and then he finally starts to kind of pick up on it at the final five, where he does realize that Brian and Clay are closer than he realized and does try to flip the game at that point, but ends up failing to get Jan on board and then ends up even voting for Jan in that round. So, I mean, I'm kind of conflicted on his game because I do think early on in his game, I do think he actually plays decently well in terms of his positioning on the original Chewy Gone. However, it's really like, from the post merge on like he's on the bottom and like should know he's on the bottom but doesn't really try to make a move until it's too late 
where he had the bank on Jan and with Jan being a bad player in her own right, that's such a bad position to be in. So I think with Ted, there is like a level of potential there. But I do think one, obviously, he was completely snowed by Brian for a lot of the game. And at the moment that he wasn't, it was just a bit too late. Plus, also, he didn't really have anyone wanting to take him to the end. If he got to the end, he would have had to win out. And even in that position, I don't even think it's a guarantee that he would win. Considering it didn't seem like the Suchai's had that much respect for him. Considering it didn't seem like most of this cast had that, that much respect for him. So, again, for me, I feel like out of the people remaining he was probably the least likely to ever get into a final two scenario and even if he does he's not guaranteed to win so because of that for me he is here at number six now number five we're moving on to the earliest boot left on the board and that is the merge boot of the season we do have ken and for me ken and the next person we'll be talking about were pretty close to be honest i literally changed it right before i made the video as i do think ken is someone that was obviously in the majority alliance on Suk Chai for a lot of it. it. Was always part of the core of Suk Chai, where it did seem like him and Jake were very close, and they were a solid grouping. He had the alliance with Xi'an as well, that put him in a good position. And to be honest, I think I thought of Ken as a better player than what he was until this latest rewatch. Where not that my opinion has really like gone down that that much, but I think through thinking about his end game scenarios, it has made me go down him a bit, mainly in the fact that. He is this high, obviously, because I do think he was part of the core of Sukchai, to where if Sukchai had gotten the numbers after the merge, I do think more than likely the final two is Ken and Jake. I, I think they are probably taking each other to the end. And I think the assumption for me was that Ken was going to win. However, I do think when looking at the jury votes, like, I don't know if it's there. I, I do think it's a bit up in the air, and I actually lean towards Jake getting the win, where I do think Jake probably gets the votes of brian penny and aaron for sure and then jan becomes like a major swing vote in that position so the fact that ken doesn't even have that final two scenario like locked in to me is something that did lower my opinion of his game also i feel like ken is a player that i think after this rewatch kind of reminded me of the way that roddy from big brother 3 plays the game and the fact that he is really harping on how honest and loyal he is and how he's never going to break his word and does it in a very manipulative way. I mean, he does it in a way where he's trying to guilt people into working with him and going his way, but is still like mostly ineffective in doing so. I mean, we do see this in his conversation with Rob where he tries to get Rob to think that Ken is the one that's been saving Rob the entire time and Rob just simply doesn't believe him. We also have him trying to stop Xi'an from flipping. Talking about if Xi'an flips, she'll be known as a rat for her entire life. But she ends up flipping anyway. And like really, I just feel like Ken is mostly ineffective in this game. Despite the fact that he was pretty well positioned in the game. Now, obviously, I don't fault him too much for the way that he actually ends up going home. As it's like, what is he going to do at that point? He's down numbers 5-3. to three. He is the biggest threat on the board from a physical standpoint. It's like, it's obvious that Ken is going home at that point. There's not really much he could really do. But I do feel like some hesitancies with his winning chances. And also just some kind of questionable tactics along the way. Did leave him a little bit lower for me on the rewatch to where he is here at number 5. Now, number four, moving on to the other Sukchai member, the last remaining Sukchai member on the list, and that person is Jake. And again, Jake moved up a spot for me after I finished my rewatch. And Jake is a player that, like, my opinion of him hasn't really changed that much. It's more so that my opinion of Ken went down, like, slightly. Now, I do think Ken, as a whole, was better positioned than Jake, I think, through the fact that I think Sheehan was more loyal to Ken than she was to Jake. But also, I do think Jake probably had more loyalty with Penny and Aaron than Ken did. To where I think he probably had more options earlier in the game. Though I do suspect that Jake would have gone to the end with Ken. But again, even in that position, I don't think it's a guaranteed loss for Jake. I think Jake could potentially even win in that scenario. And also a thing to elevate him above Ken here is the fact that obviously he has longevity. He survived two more rounds than Ken. And also really fought more than Ken. Again, Ken doesn't really even try to really stay in his eventual boot round. While Jake is the one that's actively doing more work. He's trying to work on Brian and Clay and trying to get them to flip. He later tries to work on Ted and Helen and getting them to flip. It's like he does put in a lot of work. And while none of it is successful, I do at least respect the fact that he was trying to stay despite the fact that all the odds were stacked against him. Now, obviously, this ends up leading to him burning some of his relationships with, like, Clay by the time he leaves. And he does have some poor social play at points where some of the Chewy Gons find him annoying. But, like, I think at the end of the day, like, 
there's not much more Jake could really do. I, I feel like he did the best he could considering the position he was given. And I do think if he was given a better position, he is a pretty likely winner. Now, he does technically get duped during the Penny round where Penny is convinced to vote against him. And he also is just blindsided by that occurrence. So I don't think that's the greatest look for him from a game perspective. But really, for me, the debate between Ken and Jake is just kind of close. Like, I think they're very similar, where I think they're the most likely final two. I think the actual votes come out pretty close. And really, I think Jake was probably the best positioned short term within the Sukjai group. I, I do think, obviously, the question is, does anyone actually take him to final two outside of Ken? That's a big question mark. But for me, it is the longevity and him more actively playing the game at the end. That do put him above Ken for me at the end of the day, so he's here number four. Now, number three, we're moving on to a player that I did have lower on the list until really the last second here, due to the fact that this player really had no chance at winning the game, but the fact that they still made it to the end and still did have impressive moves here and there, I do end up having at number three here, Clay. And again, Clay to me is such a weird case because he is this massive goat in the game. That is the way he was perceived. He was perceived as this person that is never going to win the game. But despite that, he's still given three votes to Final Tribal. One away from beating Brian, someone that is considered one of the most dominant winners of all time, in a position where like Clay like actively burns like Jake and Helen's votes at Final Tribal. So the fact that Clay still comes one vote away from winning despite those things is really insane. Which, at the end of the day, like, I think is a minor pro against Clay, though is also a major knock against Brian. But again, I think there are elements of Clay's game that are pretty solid. And he is obviously in the majority alliance on Chewie Gone the entire time, being aligned with Brian and Ted early on, though is still being targeted along the way. And, I, and that's something I do knock Clay for is the fact that he's the person that is getting a lot of the brunt of the heat for that group, where no one ever directly targets Brian across the season. They instead decide to target Clay. And this happens numerous times across the season. That the fact that, again, Clay, someone that is looked at as such a big goat at the end, the fact that he is the person being targeted, I think is a knock against him there. But again, once we get to the fake merge, I do feel like Clay does some good work. I mean, he does do a really good job at bonding with the Sukjais. I mean, he is the first person to end up talking to Xi'an. That makes her feel welcome to where she does eventually flip. He does also clearly make good relationships with Aaron and Penny, where when they end up voting for him to win, that is the main reason they vote for him is due to the fact that he tried to make relationships with them. He also actively has pretty good jury management with Penny in the sense that he pretends to try to save her and even votes for Jake in her eventual boot in order to put her on the jury in a position where she's obviously going to vote for him. I think the problem is the fact that he obviously kind of gives up afterwards. Like with Jake, like he doesn't even try to gain Jake's jury vote and really just trashes on Jake during his boot round, which is all really bad. Despite how angry Ted and Helen were at Brian, he's still not able to pick up their votes in position where he comes into Final Tribal talking about how he's hoping to get votes from people being bitter at Brian. But, I mean, again, like, it is impressive that he is essentially working with Brian from beginning to end in a position where he is making moves on his own at points that do end up benefiting his game. It's just, I think it's a shame that he doesn't really fully go all in on that. He kind of gives up on trying to manage the jury with his original Chugan members of which he ends up losing all of their votes at the end and all of them go to Brian. He has a questionable final trial performance where like, I think it's a very mixed bag. He does do good work in securing Penny's vote and getting Aaron's vote, but then also just throws away Helen and Jake's votes by not bothering to give them answers. And like, that's not good. So it's like, again, like it's a very mixed game. It's a game where like, technically he was a goat. Like, I mean, I don't think he beats anybody in this season. But the fact that he comes one vote away from beating one of the most impressive players in the history of the show up until this point is very impressive in itself. But again, like almost every other element of his game is a very mixed bag where he is someone that has good jury management points, has some bad jury management. He does have points where he does have some agency in the game, but then other points where he just rides the coattails of Brian. So I get a very mixed bag of a game for me, but I do end up landing him here at number three. Now, number two, we have a player that's to me, the main reason this person is higher than Clay is win equity. Where I do think for most aspects of the game, I do think Clay played a technically better game in terms of navigating through the game. But this person is higher because I think they win if they get to the end and we're somewhat close to getting there. And that person is Helen. 
and here, really, I think the main difference between Clay and Helen is the fact that obviously Brian was actually loyal to Clay while he wasn't to Helen. But the fact that Helen probably wins against most people here, I think, is something to definitely prop her up. I do think she definitely beats Clay. She definitely beats Jan. I do question does she beat Brian? Like, I think that would have been relatively close. I can see it leading her way with her getting the same votes that Clay had gotten, but also probably getting Ted and then potentially even Jan in this situation. So again, I, I think if Brian had made the mistake in taking Helen to Yen, she could probably win that. Or even if Helen just won out, won the last two challenges, I, I think she probably would win. The problem is that that's really her only path at that point. I mean, really no one was actually taking her to the end by the time of the final four, especially when we see how easily manipulated Jan is by Brian. Like, I really don't think... Helen had much of a end game scenario here outside of really just winning out. And obviously, like the greatest flaw of her game is the fact that she was too loyal to Brian. But despite that, we do see her actually doing some work the previous round and trying to flip the vote onto Clay, where she does team up with Ted and try to get Jan to flip on Clay. That is something, at least. Again, it still wasn't Brian. Mind you, they wouldn't have had the chance to get rid of Brian anyway, as Brian wins out from this point forward. But yeah, at least she tries in that round. And then beyond that, again, her game's, like, not that dissimilar from the rest of Chuigan. Like, most of them vote in line for a lot of the tribals. I mean, she does technically not vote John Raymond out, but, I mean, that's such an insignificant thing. And then she's obviously the swing during the Gandia vote. In a position where I do think she probably makes the right call there. I mean, it's tough to go to rocks for Gandia, where I don't think any of the guys were ever flipping. So, again, I, I fully get why she flips there. But beyond that, again, like, she's mostly just riding along with the Paganging. Though, really, I think Ted and Helen should have probably made their move at 6 if they were ever going to do it. The problem is that, obviously, it never seemed to really come to their mind until after Jake was gone. Largely due to the fact that they didn't trust Jake by that point. Which, again, part, part of that is crediting Brian and Clay for making them not think that they could trust Jake. But for me, Helen, again, I, I think technically on paper, I think Clay probably played the better game in terms of navigating through the game. I think in terms of playing the game more actively. But for me, Helen definitely had more winning chances by the end game here. It's where I think Helen beats probably any of the Chuigan members on the board. So because that for me, Helen lands here at number two. And now number one, the best player from Survivor Thailand is very obvious. I mean, obviously it is Brian Heideck, the winner of the season. And I mean, again, it's not close. Like there's like such a massive gap in between Helen and Brian to where Brian is one of the best players of Survivor just in general up until this point. However, I still have a lot of reservations with Brian's game. I think on paper, Brian plays one of the most dominant games that has ever been played. Like he is in the majority the entire time. He is not necessarily this big alpha leader figure, but he is leading the tribe in terms of the fact that he is the best in challenges of the group. He is the person that is known for his work ethic, while also being the best positioned in the tribe, where again, he does instantly have these relationships with Clay, Helen, and Ted that allow him to take control of the game early on through the vote out of John. He has a good relationship with Tanya, but cuts her due to the fact that she's sick. Obviously, holds numbers through the Gandia vote in a position where I suspect a lot of the reason why Helen flips is due to her relationship with Brian. But again, like he's coming into the merge, having final twos with everyone in the Chuigan 5, with the exception of Jan, who is someone that is still not really playing the game and is still willing to just follow whatever Brian is doing. So again, that is a very impressive element of Brian's game, is just how much control he had over his individual group. The problem is that I think he lacks that control of the people outside of his group, where he just doesn't bother to create relationships with any of the Sukchai members. I mean, even Xi'an, who we do see him do some active work in flipping over, he doesn't even remember her name. And moving forward, the Aaron and Pennies of the world, he doesn't even bother to make a relationship with to where they don't want to vote for him at the end. He has a massive misread on Ken to where he makes this untelevised move that Ken obviously references at Final Tribal of telling Ken that we're targeting Ted because we can't let two black people win in a row, which is such a terrible thing to say, obviously, but is also through this misguided notion from Brian of his just assuming that Ken is racist. 
which really just shows you some of the messiness of Brian's game there. But obviously he just had his main group in such lockstep that it didn't really matter. But I think he does really bad work with a lot of the Sukjai members, really all of them except for Jake. He does actively bad work with, to where he does do good work in bonding with Jake, to where him and Jake are the big workhorses around camp. So again, I do give him some credit there. But then we have him eventually obviously blindsiding Ted and Helen, which I do think are the optimal moves strategically, getting to the final three with Jan and Clay. Jan, who can't win a competition to save her life, and Clay, this perceived big jury goat. I think those are optimal moves. I don't like the way he handles them, though. One, he lies really terribly to Ted, to the point where Ted picks up on the fact that, oh, Brian's flipping on me. I need to get Helen and Jan together to take out Clay now. Like, that's bad in its own right. But also, I don't like how much he plays the victim. Like, a lot of his endgame revolves around him trying to rationalize these moves to Helen because a lot of the way that he acts in these last few rounds of the game and also how he acts at Final Tribal is that he's playing up the victim. Like he's trying to make it seem like this is your fault for getting voted out. It's not my fault that you turned on me. So I'm taking you out when they were never actually turning on him and really just becomes a bad look for him as it makes it look like he's not willing to own up to his game. And again, the fact that he only wins against Clay in a 4-3 to three vote is really just an embarrassment. Like, it's like, I know people claim that, okay, Brian had the four votes locked in, it doesn't matter, but it does matter. Because, again, you can never be that sure on Survivor of what's going on, especially in Ponderosa. You don't know what they're talking about, how things that are said can change people's perceptions. And we even hear on this season that, that Ted was very angry at Brian to where he was considering voting for Clay, but it's not until Helen tells Ted that Clay might have made some racist remarks that that really turns Ted against Clay. The same thing could happen the other way around where again Ken had this information knowing that Brian had made a racist comment and had he gone to Ted and told Ted about this this could very much flip Ted against Brian in, in the way that the same thing said about Clay did to him also. So again for me like the fact that he only wins four to three is a massive indictment there. But also I think something else that's not really talked about is the reason why he wins four to three here. Where a lot of people obviously talk about Brian Heideck as this dominant player, one of the strategic masterminds of the game, but that's not why he wins. He literally wins because of his work ethic. That's literally what most of the jury members that vote for him point out. Literally, Jake, Helen, and Jan all mention that they're voting for Brian because he worked more than Clay, because Clay was lazy around camp. To where Brian's actual gameplay was actually a thing that people didn't like. Like, people like Helen and Ted did not respect the way that Brian played the end of the game but more so voted for him as a vote against clay so again for me brian's jury management is really like the biggest knock against his game where even in situations where people talk about boston rob in redemption island as having bad jury management because the jury was looking for someone else to vote for but couldn't because he got to the end against philip and natalie to where they were forced to vote for him brian doesn't even have that brian got to the situation that rob got to and he's in the end against clay who was essentially his philip but even then almost half the jury is deciding to still vote for that philip figure so I really do feel like Brian lucks his way into winning this jury vote in a position where he does almost everything wrong in order to get the votes themselves. And how he handles his jury management is really just lucked up by the fact that Clay does even worse. That being said, again, his navigation through the game is pretty brilliant. I mean, again, like he is extremely dominant through the game, holds control from beginning to end, has final twos with three of the final five. And again, Jan is someone that never was going to take him out anyway. So again, that's all really, really impressive. But it's just so harmed to me by his jury management. That again, doesn't affect him on this list where again, he's still number one for Thailand by a lot. But I think when looking at his winning game, that's obviously something I bring up. And really, I think as a player, Brian is definitely still a player that I have a lot of question marks on. And where I think the cast of Survivor Thailand is one that did greatly benefit him. Largely, the tribe of Chuigan is a tribe that greatly benefited him. To where he had some like-minded people that did allow him to take control where I don't think Brian Heideck is able to do what he does on this season on most other given casts, particularly on a modern season. I think Brian Heideck is pretty doomed on 
any season with any semblance of dynamic gameplay. To where, like, even on this season, we do get the Sukjais wanting to flip the boat on Brian, but are never able to actually do so, obviously. But really, I don't look at Brian Heideck as that skilled of a player to where he's able to overcome high levels of adversity. And we see him again in that conversation with Ted, where Ted picks up on the fact that he's lying to him pretty instantly. And Brian really never faces adversity throughout this entire season. And again, once we see him get confronted, he tries to play the victim and like I, I just feel like there's a lot of big holes for me in Brian Hayek's game to where I know some people say that he's the best to ever play due to how dominant he was and how he had four jury votes locked in however I, I just cannot look at that as the case when I feel like there are so many instances that could have gone wrong here and the fact that I just do not see this game being very repeatable really at all so again have a lot of reservations for this game but again in terms of the players from survivor thailand it's not even close he's the very clear number one here but there we go i mean that is my ranking of every player from survivor thailand Ozzy down the road i will be continuing on with my series of retrospectives for survivor at some point that survivor amazon next so stay tuned for that and obviously just stay tuned for more survivor big brother other random videos down the road but for now that is the video thank you for watching